started a new series last Sunday that I called Unstuck. Uh, Going to go through some various different areas that people deal with uh, that, they, that they get stuck in. This morning we'll be in Matthew chapter 6. If you want to open there, this is uh, part of the Sermon on the Mount there. Pretty familiar passage to many of you, but nonetheless very rich with truth for us. Isn't it amazing? i to get to the right book. There we go. Isn't it amazing how simple decisions can haunt us? Can kind of trip us up between kids and work and bills and, and, and worry seems to always be kind of right there. Worry is overwhelming at times. As uh, pastor and author Chuck Swindoll said, worry pulls tomorrow's clouds over today's sunshine. The word that we get worry from comes from a German word I'm not going to pronounce because I don't speak German. But it literally means to strangle, constrict, choke. Life is too short to worry about everything that can go wrong. Because there is plenty that can go wrong. And now we know this, right? This is not like news to you. You understand this. We, we comprehend that worry does not really work very well with faith. And yet, that in itself makes us worry. <laughs> because why am I worrying? I don't have enough faith then, right? So there's just this cycle that we get into with worry. And it's not healthy for us or for the people around us. It's been said that we should quit worrying about life because we won't get out of it alive anyway. You know, you don't survive it. It's also been said that over 90% of the things that we worry about don't happen, so therefore, worrying works. That's not true either, right? And so we know that it's a problem. And we have, like, self-talk and try to figure it out, but it doesn't work very well. We, we have something better than that. We have God. We have a God who loves us, who walks with us, who upholds us. In fact, Scripture tells us in Isaiah 41.10, Fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So you aren't going to necessarily will yourself out of worry because that's just hard for us. Rational thinking doesn't always do it. Instead, we look to God, and we base our lives on a relationship with him, that he is the one we gain our strength from, he is the one we're held by, and we need to understand the importance of that. We need to understand how serious it is for us. I, I thought of, here's how I look at it, whether you like it or not, I guess. Uh, there was a video that was, you know, one of these viral videos that was out there all over the place of a little girl who wanted to pet a dog. She said, and it was, a, it was actually a bear. You ever see that? It was like behind a, a fence, and she's like, Mom, I want to pet the dog. And Mom's like, no, you can't pet the dog. It's not a dog. You know? And um, I got to thinking, like, that is kind of what we're talking about here. That we're not going to try to pet the bear. That we need to address these things like what they are. It's, it's not something we can just soft pedal and say, oh, it's okay, no big deal. No, it affects us. It, it affects our life. It affects our relationships. We're not just like thinking about a lot of things. We're not having a few concerns. Worry is a problem for us. Today in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus talks about worry. Some people are just real worriers. Some people just really are very good at it, and maybe that's your experience. Maybe you know people like this who worry about everything, every siren they hear, every sort of news event, everything that goes on suddenly there's a worry. But Jesus instructs us here that worry and trust in God really don't go together. We're called to trust God completely for both our present life and our life to come. Oswald Chambers, I love the way he puts this. If you're familiar with him, he writer from many years ago. He said, once we see Jesus, the impossible things he does in our lives become as natural as breathing. The agony we suffer is only the result of the deliberate shallowness of our own heart. I don't like that. You know, that, that kind of points at me, doesn't it? We won't believe. We won't let go by severing the line that secures the boat to the shore. We prefer to worry. 
And so we ask ourselves this question, what is our level of worry? What is keeping you up at night? What is occupying your time, your mind, your heart? What is taking the, the best parts of you from other people? You see, Jesus loves us too much to keep us in that place, to leave us in that place. If you're stuck there, you can be free. And that's what's so freeing about it. Worry gets us stuck, but Jesus frees us from the things that paralyze us, from the things that, that slow us down. He is a freedom-giving God. So let me read this section here. Verse 25, it says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow they do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown to the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall I eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. There's a call for us here to trust God completely, presently, and for what is to come. Why? Because worrying accomplishes nothing of value. God promises to provide for you, as you trust him. Jesus starts off with a very practical illustration. He says, hey, look at the birds. Like, they're out gathering worms, gathering bugs, maybe a little bird seed if they've got a nice neighborhood, someone who feeds them. But they're taken care of. Every day, they're taken care of. Birds aren't worrying about it. They just go out, get what's provided for them, and they survive. Now, the point here is not, like, don't prepare, right? Because we are people who have minds and are able to prepare. We're not birds. The point is, are we trying to control all the things based on fear and thereby taking our trust off of God who promised he would provide? But notice also that there is work involved here, right? It's not like the birds are just standing out in the field with their beaks open like, and God's, like, dumping things into their mouth, Right? There is work. They go out and they gather. But God provides. And that's what we need. They don't seem overly stressed about it. In fact, sometimes just stop and watch the birds like fluttering around. They're just having a great old time singing, playing in the rain, making a mess. Maybe we need to do that more. It tells, it tells us something about what he's saying. He also says, look at the, the flowers, the lilies of the field. You don't, they don't have fancy clothing stores or designer brand names or any of those things. They're clothed with beauty that God provides for them. And we would do well to remember that. As the pressure comes to chase things and have things and look a certain way so people will admire us, beauty is not something that comes from those things, but beauty comes from God. It says, He made you, you are made in His image. And so Jesus tells them, look at the flowers. Even in Israel, where the flowers did not last long because the climate did not allow them to, they were still beautiful. And if that is what God does with the flowers who are here today and, the gone, and gone tomorrow, how much more will he take care of you, he says. You are his treasure possession. possession. You are his, made in his image. So trust him. You know the provision of God, so don't stress over it. Don't worry. Don't let those things preoccupy your mind. And so, it's a reminder to enjoy what God has given. Because enjoying what God has given is often ignored to get or possess more. The desire for more, for better, for stuff has gripped us as people. It's something we have to fight because we live in a 
society that has everything anytime we want it. You can get anything you want. But Jesus says this in verse 32. He says, For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. The pagans run after all those things, but your heavenly Father knows that you need. So it, does that mean you can't go buy the new iPhone? I, you know, I don't know. Go ahead if you want to. That's not what this is talking about. But the section is precluded by a conversation on storing up treasures in heaven. In verse 24, it says, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Money and the appeal to have more, more, more is a dangerous place for us to be because it captures our heart and it creates unnecessary worry. It makes us want and makes us want to get, that makes us want to have to the point where we occupy our mind and our heart with it. So we can't preoccupy our life in gaining more stuff. We've been given all we need in Christ. We enjoy life far more if we don't elevate stuff over God and the people around us. Materialism can enslave a person to such a degree that it dominates life because all these things are temporary, and temporary means temporary, so don't overemphasize it. But you are not solving any problems by worrying. Jesus asked a question in verse 27. He says, Who, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Well, the answer is no one. But in, in fact, we might, as they've studied it, actually be taking hours off our life with stress that we put on ourselves by stressing over things that we can't control. It might actually be making our health worse. We've had times, I've had times, when I've been preoccupied with something, maybe a decision I need to make, or this change I felt was coming, or maybe you're waiting on like test results or something like that, and you're just kind of tied up in knots. I don't like being in that place. Nobody really does. It's unsettling. You can't sleep. You can't eat. You feel anxious. What's our job there? What do we do there? Well, he says that he is upholding me by my righteous right hand. Sometimes it feels like we just can't let something go, but we need to let something go. Sometimes we feel like we need to do more. We need to fix it. We need to make it work. But how much more can we really do? And that's the question we need to ask ourselves. We're inundated with news about the economy, about things like, uh, uh, will the inflation increase? Will the economy crash? Will a cyber attack take down the grid? You know, AT&T. Um, hello. Uh, no. What can we really control? What more can we really do? If anything, it's a reminder when we start to worry, a reminder to pray. In fact, that's the very thing the Bible tells us to do. Paul said this in Philippians. He said, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. He says, do not be anxious, but instead be people of prayer. So if you start to feel worry, you start to feel concern, go to prayer. That should be the signal in your spirit that you need to go to prayer. Are you staying up at night, staring at the ceiling, worrying about something you can't control? Pray. There is plenty that can go wrong. But we also know that God is able to calm fears and provide comfort, even if those questions we're asking aren't getting answered how we think they should. So then, does worry accomplish anything? Well, no, it doesn't accomplish anything. In fact, later in the Gospel of Matthew, we find this. This is a verse in the context of the parable of the sower. Remember that, where the seed was sown in different soils, and it grew different fruit. And here's what it says. As for what was sown among the thorns, it's the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves Unfruitful. What choked off the fruit? Worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth. It's a battle that we must fight. But the Lord gives us strength. In fact, here's another verse you can maybe memorize. Maybe you want to memorize this one and add it to you, the ones that you use in your own life. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? 
The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Choose to worship. Choose to see him. Choose to grab onto him as your stronghold and not the stuff that weighs you down. So worrying accomplishes nothing of value, but the other side of it is seeking God satisfies the unsettled heart. Worry is unsettling. It winds us up inside. Instead of seeking all the temporary things and trying to solve all the world's problems, Jesus says this instead in verse 33. He says, seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. You are spiritual beings, and the only way you can be satisfied is to seek God. Physical comforts aren't guaranteed, even for those who trust in Christ. But we can have joy, we can have peace, among all, lots of other things, if we put our life in Christ, who satisfies the longings of our heart and fills that void inside of us. And so the ultimate call here is to deeper life in Christ, to settle your life, your future, your all in Him. In fact, I love this verse, another one you can memorize. Psalm 46.10, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in all the earth. Be still. How often do we do that? I'm not very good at that. I'm always moving. Be still and know that I am God. The, the NASB version says, Stop striving and know. Believe this. Do this. Give up desire for control and seek God, seek his ways, surrender your heart to him. A.W. Tozer, Alliance pastor many years ago in the Chicago area, back in the 1960s, wrote this. He says, to the, any inquirer I would say, just do the next thing you know you should do to carry out the will of the Lord. If there is sin in your life, quit it instantly. Put away lying, gossip, dishonesty, or whatever your sin may be. Forsake worldly pleasures, extravagance in spending, vanity in dress, in your car, in your home. Get right with any person you may have wronged. Forgive everyone who may have wronged you. Begin to use your money to help the poor and advance the cause of Christ. Take up the cross and live sacrificially. Pray, attend the Lord's services, witness for Christ, not only when it is convenient, but when you should. Look at no cost and fear no consequences. Study the Bible to learn the will of God and then do his will as you understand it. Start now by doing the next thing and then go on from there. Do the next thing. Whatever that thing is, what's the next thing for you? We can be unsettled and worried and stressed and anxious and fearful and me standing here and saying, stop doing that isn't going to fix that. In fact, you remember that uh, years ago that Bob Newhart skit where he was a counselor and this lady comes in and she's like, got these issues, and he's like, I'll give you two words. Write it down. And stop it. It doesn't work that way. That's funny on TV. It doesn't work that way. We can't just, oh, stop it. Okay, I'm good now. It's funny. We have some intentional steps we can take, though, to sort of put ourselves in a direction, move ourselves towards Christ. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, for example, that would be where it starts, right? Because you can't seek his kingdom if you're not a part of his kingdom. You don't have to settle for this temporary life when he can give you eternal life and you know that you will be with him. And that comes when you give your heart to Jesus and you ask him to be your savior, to forgive your sins, to surrender your life to him and say, Jesus, I, I don't want it anymore to, do, to, to be in charge of this. I want you to be my God and my Lord and he will change you if you ask him to. He knows what tomorrow brings and it enables us to live today. I've often told people, and it comes from this text, right, that you don't need to buy trouble because there's enough trouble. You don't need to go looking for it. We don't know what the next year holds, the next day holds, the next hour holds. We don't know all these things, but I can trust the one who does. So much anxiety, however, today. They started to compile data back uh, years ago now, specifically among teenagers, but about anxiety and depression and they just saw this like, increase. The younger generations, kind of the generation Z, Y, and Z, younger than me, kind of the kids and, and teenagers and early college students. 
most anxious of any generation ever. And they, of course, they asked the question, why? Well, some studies have been done back in 2017. Harvard had a study. It was very anecdotal. Uh, but they started looking at social media use and how it increases anxiety and what it does to the brain. There's more sleeplessness. There's more loneliness. There's more worry. There's more depression. And it was suggested that really these things started to pick up even more when the use of smartphones became really popular. More recent years, more studies have come out suggesting even adults, uh, older adults or, or adults, who spend significant time on social media, scrolling, watching videos with no breaks, have far more anxiety than those who don't. More social anxiety, social terrors, they call it. Now, lots of reasons, again, some is anecdotal, but it's interesting that maybe self-esteem, maybe comparisons, maybe lack of personal close relationships, maybe just a non-stop connection to this online presence with no buffer and no silence and no ability to stop and be still is causing real negative effects on us. Cuts into sleep as people scroll when they should be sleeping, spending time on media when they should be resting, leading to increased worry and increased stress. Interesting. What's my point, though? Right? The point is, is that the weight of worry is overwhelming, and there are things that we can do, and maybe that's one place, I don't know, that we can do to sort of take some of that burden off, that we can do some, do, create boundaries with things like social media or whatever it might be, to sit and enjoy the people you're with, to relax, to take it in, to seek God. But finally, in all of this, we must realize that Christ has given us victory. In other words, we have nothing to really worry about if we've been given Christ because he has given us everything we need in himself. He knows what we need, and our biggest and greatest need is to be forgiven for our sins, and he has done that for us. In Christ, we've been saved from spiritual death. So really, if the stock market crashes, or if the food gets scarce, or wars happen, or natural disasters, which I don't hope any of that stuff happens, but if it does, we're okay. Because we've been given a victory in Christ. We've been given him, his life. And him is all we need. So what weighs you down? What's keeping you up? What are the stressors of your life? The challenge here is to turn those things over to Jesus your entire life. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Some of you need rest. Rest that has been fleeting, but rest is what we need. Our mind needs to get unstuck. What brings you joy? What produces rest in you? Do those things. Jesus Christ never changes. He's never threatens. He, he threatened. He holds your life and salvation in his hands and freedom from sin. And think about this. One day we will see him. Someday we will be in his presence. And all those cares and worries that seem so big right now will seem so trivial because our life is ultimately found in him. He holds the future. Let me just add this, too, at the end of this also, is that sometimes I understand, like I'm not, I'm not soft-pedaling things, right? If there are some significant issues that people face, and sometimes there are needs for professional assistance in that, and that is totally okay. And, and, and normal, and people all the time need help. So if you need help, do reach out that way. That's, I'm certainly not wanting to communicate that that is not an okay thing. But things happen, people hurt one another, we make mistakes, and every day we choose to trust him, to cast our cares and burdens on Christ. Today, you might have some issues, but in Christ, ultimately, we know things are going to be okay. Let's pray. Lord, we know that worry is a weight for us, stress, things that we feel like we need to control that we can't. But Lord, we are grateful that you are in control of all things, that you are working in us even now. And, and I just recognize that in a room like this, there are people who are struggling. They're just struggling with things. They can't figure it out. They can't make 
way with it. And Lord, I pray that you would provide answers, provide steps, provide resources to move forward, to get unstuck. I do pray for those who maybe have never trusted you, maybe have never even said, yes, I want to follow Jesus, that today will be the day they say, yeah, I do. I, that's where it needs to start. I can't do it on my own. I've tried my way, I've, and I've failed, and I need a new path. We thank you that you give us new life, that you give us second chances, third chances, many chances, because you are a gracious and loving God. So I pray you'd help us. Help us, Lord, to trust you, to not look at all the doom and gloom that comes from media and everywhere else, but to continue to go back to what you said, that you said you would take care of us. You said that we are, are not to worry about tomorrow because you are taking care of it. So help us, Lord, to do that, to apply what you've said, to trust you for all things, and to take you at your word, we pray. All these things in Jesus' name.